I don't know. Okay. Where's my... Where's my... So you know we're not going to report anything tonight, right? Yeah, yeah. Show it up. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the Rules Committee will come to order. So the Rules Committee will come to order, everybody. So American businesses are competing in a global marketplace every single day. In 2018, the United States shipped over $2.5 trillion worth of goods, everything from aircrafts to agricultural products. Companies in my district alone exported $8 million worth of goods during that time. That includes minority-owned, women-owned, and small businesses. The United States is now the third largest exporter, so I know that many of my colleagues are seeing similar success, success stories in their own districts. That didn't happen overnight, and it didn't happen by accident. It's often due to the financing provided by the Export-Import Bank. So while we know we have much more work uh, to do to narrow our trade deficit and bring manufacturing jobs back to our shores, I'm proud that all around the world, consumers are using products that proudly read Made in America. The bill we are considering today will ensure that continues. H.R. 4863 reauthorizes and modernizes XM's charter through 2029 and includes provisions promoting everything from diversity and clean energy to IT infrastructure. In the last 10 years, XM has created 1.7 million jobs in the United States. Uh, through acting today, we can set the stage for success for another decade. Uh, with that, let me now turn to my distinguished ranking member from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole, for any remarks he would like to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing represents yet another missed opportunity for bipartisanship in this Congress. That's right. We're That's right. My daughter keeps on changing it's, my ringtone. It's, uh, it's, it's hard to beat that. It's called sickle mode. I, I, mean, I like your yeah. daughter's taste there. <laughs> you know, I, I wish I had a younger son. Um, today's hearing Sorry. represents yet another missed opportunity for bipartisanship this Congress. We're considering H.R. 4863, a bill to reauthorize and reform the Export-Import Bank of the United States. Even though XM's uh, vital role in promoting the U.S. Uh, promoting U.S. commerce and helping job creators is recognized by members of both sides of the aisle, we still ended up here with a partisan bill. It's an unfortunate result, and I say that as someone who's always voted for the renewal of uh, XM, um, especially since a bipartisan bill was previously negotiated and agreed to by the chair and the ranking member of the Financial Services Committee. I look forward to hearing the testimony today as to how we got from a bipartisan deal to this partisan piece of legislation. But I want to note that I share many of the same concern with today's bill that the ranking, that ranking member McHenry raised during the Financial Services Committee markup two weeks ago. In particular, I agree with Mr. McHenry that stronger measures are needed to prevent abuses by the Chinese government and entities owned by the Chinese government. The bipartisan bill that both uh, Chairwoman uh, Waters and Ranking Member McHenry introduced together earlier this year H.R. 3407 actually includes such measures. Uh, the bill before us today, unfortunately, does not. H.R. 3407 also included several key reforms to XM, such as provisions to strengthen the small business access to capital, congressional oversight measures, and strengthening uh, debarment penalties for fraud and corruption. Today's bill does not include these measures either. Uh, I think uh, we as a House can do better, Mr. Chairman, and with that, I look forward to our discussion, and I yield back. Thank you very much, and I'd like to welcome our witnesses uh, to provide testimony on H.R. 4863, the United States Export Finance Agency Act. Uh, Chairwoman Waters and Mr. Stivers, we are delighted that you are here. Uh, anything you brought in writing will, without objection, be entered into the record. And I'd now like to recognize the gentlewoman from California, uh, Chairwoman Waters. Thank you very much, Chairman McGovern. Ranking Member Cole and members of the committee for having me here to testify on H.R. 4863, the United States Export Finance Agency Act of 2019, which reauthorizes and makes key improvements to the job-creating Export-Import Bank, that is, XM. In the last decade, XM Bank has supported more than 1.5 million American jobs at no cost to the taxpayer finance more than $255 billion in U.S. exports and remitted more than $3.5 billion in deficit-reducing receipts. 
to the Treasury. The bank's activities have a positive impact for American workers across the country. But in 2015, when XM Bank last needed to be reauthorized, Congress, under Republican leadership, allowed the bank's charter to expire for the first time in the bank's history. At that time, some countries, including China, celebrated the bank's closure because it would help to give them a competitive advantage over U.S. businesses and workers. If we fail to reauthorize the bank, American businesses will be harmed and thousands of jobs will be lost. And so it is critical that Congress does not allow the bank's charter to lapse again. And it's also time for key reforms to the bank. So that's why I've put forth this bill, H.R. 4863. H.R. 4863 reauthorizes the XM Bank for 10 years and increases the bank's lending authority from $135 billion to $175 billion and provides critical reforms to enhance the flexibility, accountability, resiliency, and inclusivity of the bank's operations to ensure its continued ability to support U.S. exports and promote U.S. jobs. The bank strengthens support for small businesses, which are the engine of growth in our economy, and it creates an office of minority and women inclusion and an office of territorial exporting to support exporters in Guam, Puerto Rico, and other U.S. territories. The bill also focused the bank's attention on protecting the environment by creating an office of financing for renewable energy energy efficiency, and energy storage exports, strengthening the agency's environmental policies and procedures, and encouraging greater accountability with respect to local communities that could be negatively affected by bank-supported projects. And importantly, the bill also includes procedures to avoid a lapse in the board's quorum so that the agency can maintain its full operational capacity even when the Senate is unable to confirm board directors. Let me also note that the bill includes a number of reforms to ensure XM financing is only supporting American exporters and workers and not bad actors. For example, the bill prohibits financing for certain entities, including the Chinese Army and intelligence services and other bad actors, including anyone who has criminally violated the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act or is listed for serious violations of U.S. intellectual property laws. Moreover, any transaction that is subject to board approval would require the parties to the transaction to certify that neither they nor any of their subsidiaries engage in activities in violation of U.S. sanctions laws and regulations. The bill also makes the agency's reinsurance pilot program permanent and gives the agency more flexibility to respond to China's predatory export financing practices. Finally, the bill enables the agency to modernize its IT system and recruit and retain highly qualified staff to serve in key roles, particularly in financial and legal services. I'm also aware of several amendments that have been submitted to the Rules Committee that would make further reforms to ensure the XM Bank will support exporters throughout our economy and look forward to debating these on the floor. Mr. Chairman, it is imperative that we reauthorize the XM Bank so that it can continue with its important mission, creating American jobs and promoting American goods and services. Therefore, I urge this committee to advance H.R. 4863 to the House floor and request the committee to provide appropriate rules for its consideration. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Stivers. Welcome. Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, thanks for having me here today. Ranking Member McHenry couldn't be here, so I'm subbing in for him. It's great to be back in my old committee room, and uh, Ms. Scanlon, you're keeping my seat warm until someday I'm back here again. But uh, I appreciate the chance to... Uh, I'll hold my breath. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hold your breath that long. You'll turn red. Uh, I, uh, I do appreciate the chance to chat with you today about... Uh, H.R. 4863, the U.S. Export Finance Credit Agency Act. Uh, I'm a longtime supporter of the XM Bank, and I uh, was one of just a few Republicans on the Financial Services Committee who signed a discharge petition in 2015 to force us to a vote. And in this committee, I cast a vote to uh, allow the bill to uh, to come forward. Uh, so I, you know, I'm 
a supporter of XM, and I wish I was here today telling you that I'm here to support a bipartisan bill. Instead, the bill we're considering was rushed to the floor after a party line <laughs> vote in a markup. And, um, you know, that's unfortunate. I, you know, I think it's ironic that it's now November and the bank faces a lapse in about a month, or frankly, a few days, uh, when we could have, I think, and should have had an agreement uh, that was bipartisan. Uh, in fact, there was a, an agreement uh, between the minority member, ranking member, and the chairwoman on a bill that we were hoping to move forward with, uh, and that agreement happened all the way back in June. We could have avoided this last minute fight if, if we would have moved forward with that bill. Um, I could focus my remarks on some of the mistakes we've made in this reauthorization effort, uh, namely that our committee should have started much earlier, had much more public hearings and had more hearings, um, and frankly, a lot of the issues that we faced uh, involved the Chinese, uh, whether it's the uh, <coughs> access to the Chinese market, Chinese human rights violations, uh, technological and military ambitions of the Chinese to have superiority, superiority over the United States. Um, none of those issues are resolved in this bill, unfortunately, and so I think a lot of them are gonna resurface on amendments that you're gonna get a chance to debate and discuss whether you're gonna allow for this bill. And I would hope that you would allow us to openly debate and discuss those ideas on the House floor and talk about how we can improve this bill. Uh, maybe we could, it could result in a bipartisan bill in the end. Um, I recognize that in its current form though, um, this bill probably is not gonna be signed into law because it's probably not gonna be taken up in the Senate. So. The XM's reauthorization is now tied to the appropriations process. Uh, and I know there's talks of putting a longer term authorization of the Export Import Bank in the, author, or in the CR that we're gonna do here soon, and I support that effort and I hope we can get it done. Um, as we go forward, I, I want you to know that committee Republicans stand ready to support American exporters of all sizes. We wanna work with the majority to try to come to a, a bill that can be bipartisan. Uh, we wanna make sure we hold China accountable for their marketplace violations, their intellectual property theft, and their human rights violations, and their military ambitions. Uh, but I'm hopeful we can find a way to resolve a lot of those things in the amendment process that you get a chance to decide today. And I would again urge you to make a lot of those amendments in order. I'm grateful to be here, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you both for your testimony. Mr. Hastings, yeah. I have no questions. I welcome the witnesses. Thank them both. Thank you. Mr. Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a few questions. Um, you touched a little bit on this, Mr. Stivers, in your statement, but I know you're a strong supporter of XM Bank. I actually worked with you on that effort when we got it to the floor in a bipartisan fashion passed the bill. and. Uh, uh, a number of our leaders did not agree with that at the time, but I felt strongly about it, as I know you did. Can you explain to me in a little more detail why you can't support a bill that I know you really want to support? Sure. Uh, there's a few things I think that I'll uh, focus on really quickly. Um, you know, first of all, it delays the uh, small business mandate until the year 2028, which I, I, we, I have a lot of, the only businesses that are exporters in my district that use the Exim Bank are small businesses. And I think we need to keep the small business mandate and encourage XM to do business with small businesses and make that happen sooner rather than later. It removed some tough debarment penalties for fraud and corruption at the XM Bank that I think we all know that we need. We need to continue reforming the XM Bank. I, I do applaud the chairwoman for her efforts to bring some reforms to the XM Bank, but I, I would have liked to have seen that debarment uh, left in there because I think that was really, really important piece, and it was in that bipartisan agreement back in June. Uh, it deleted the requirement for the Treasury Secretary to redouble efforts to negotiate uh, a global reduction of export subsidies. You know, we all know that um, these export credit finance agencies are not a free market uh, entity, uh, and if everybody did away with them, it would be great, but I'm not gonna let America do away with ours when other countries have theirs but we used to tell the Treasury Secretary to negotiate to try to end all these subsidies, which again, we all should want because then we're not wasting as much money and nobody is, as long as we get rid of them all together, then that's a, that's a fair um, change. Uh, it also um, 
eliminated a uh, set aside of 20% of XM's authority on cutting edge technology like 5G that would have given us a chance to really fight against uh, the Chinese in that 5G space, which is gonna be a big deal globally and, and really important. Uh, it took away reforms uh, requiring XM to show that heavy users of the bank used as, as a lender of last resort and that um, financing of those users doesn't uh, help foreign entities at the expense of US jobs. And finally, it eliminated a due diligence review uh, that would have ensured XM didn't subsidize Chinese government controlled entities, uh, such as um, the Belt and Road Initiative, military intelligence operations. And to be fair, the chairwoman did add something on military and intelligence operations in an amendment that Denny Heck put in the bill. So, uh, that one's probably there, but intellectual property theft and illicit technology transfer and uh, Belt and Road Initiative and importation of critical technologies are uh, still at risk because those were not included in the new language, uh, the change language, this amendment that came in the bill. Okay, so those right. are some of the reasons that I uh, can't support the bill. There are actually amendments on many of these that have been filed with the Rules Committee, and if they were... Um, made an order and, and put in the bill, I could find my way to vote for this bill on the floor with those amendments. And my next question is actually addressed to both of you, and I'll, but I'll start with Mr. Stivers. Uh, we know we had at one point a bipartisan bill that had been negotiated in good faith, I know, by both sides and uh, uh, between uh, Chair Waters and uh, Ranking Member McHenry, and that seemed to have, you know, can you explain to me, number one, were you told why we didn't proceed in this way? And I want to ask, obviously, the Chair to tell us why she chose to go in a different direction. Sure, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, I can tell you that in the committee, every single Republican voted for that bill as a substitute bill, uh, even some that have never voted for an XM reauthorization in the past. So um, I, I can't, I don't have any knowledge as to why so it didn't I want to give the chair a chance to respond. To yes, um, but let me just say that <clears throat> in taking up this bill, I have a strong commitment to getting reauthorization of XM. I think it is absolutely outrageous that the United States of America has now been put in a non-competitive position uh, simply because the last chairman of the committee, Mr. Hentelin, hated XM. And he held all of the Republican members' feet to the fire. He did not like it. He would not do anything to support it. And so I was hopeful that working with Mr. Uh, uh, McHenry, uh, that we would be able. So I bent over backwards to try and get a bipartisan bill only to discover that the Chamber of Commerce, Boeing, GE, all of industry opposed the bill. And on top of that, all of organized labor opposed the bill. And then Democrats on my side of the aisle opposed the bill. I was not about to move forward with a bill, no matter how hard I had attempted to get a bipartisan agreement, when I had no support for it. And so I tried to engage Mr. McHenry to try and work out the concerns, particularly of the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce does not support me easily. And when they say uh, that they like uh, what I was doing, the direction that I was going in after I had to come back and try and get uh, them to take a strong look at what Mr. McHenry was advocating, we could not get an agreement. And so what we have before us is a bill that the Chamber of Commerce, all of industry, all of organized labor, they've all come together. And for the most part, all of the Democrats uh, have come together around this bill. There may be maybe one or two uh, that may have some concerns, but everybody else is. And I want to tell you, I was looking forward to working with Mr. Stivers because he had sent a signal that he really wanted to get reauthorization. He and a few others, Mr. Lucas and some of the others, really wanted reauthorization. And so um, I think we attempted to do all that we could. However, in the final analysis, the question becomes, even if you have some differences with the bill, are you willing to reauthorize, to get this quorum fix that we need, to deal with in ways that we can credibly deal with environmental issues? And of course, 
You have seen in my testimony to you that we have dealt with some of the issues around China. Uh, but to say that we walk away from creating jobs in many of our districts in this country and that we allow China or anybody else to be more competitive uh, than we are, I'm not willing to do that. And I would ask this committee uh, to take a look at the bill and understand when you take a look at some of the issues that have been pointed out uh, that we have done a reasonable job in dealing with those issues. And I yield back the balance of my time. Well, I certainly uh, agree with uh, my good friend, the chair, about what happened before. Uh, I didn't sign the discharge petition. You have a couple of people here that did. Uh, but uh, that's kind of a career-ending event for a deputy whip. Uh, but uh, I, was a, I, I was a deputy whip. Back yeah, then yeah, you were. <laughs> But I did vote with you guys, you know, when we actually got the discharge vote, because I, I agree with my friend, yeah. both my friends, yeah, sure. that that was good. So uh, uh, I'm struggling a little bit here because I thought we could do better. Uh, one last question, if I may, for Mr. Stivers. Um, you, you clearly, uh, you've got some concerns about the Chinese government here, and I think that's a bipartisan concern. I think we all know that uh, this is a a country that quite often signs up to play by rules and then doesn't play by the, the rules that they agreed to on paper. And I know both of you have a splendid record in trying to hold China accountable, but could you elaborate just a little bit more, Mr. Stivers, on your concerns specifically about China? Thank you. I, I'd love to. And I, and I think the chair has um, the same interest in holding China accountable as I do. I just want to make sure that we hold them accountable for their intellectual property theft, for the corruption that we see around the globe uh, when they compete against United States companies uh, and for what they've done with the Belt and Road Initiative to try to um, capture a lot of raw materials around the world and lock those up um, that becomes anti-competitive. And um, they have a very mercantilist view of the world and I think we need to be very concerned about that. As I said, the chair did include an amendment that deals with the uh, Chinese military and intelligence operations, which is a part of it. And I appreciate that, and I want to thank her sure. for those efforts. That's really important. But the intellectual property theft, the corruption, and the Belt and Road Initiative should also be addressed. And I'd really like to see an amendment made in order that would allow us to at least debate and discuss those things on the House floor. Okay. Well, thank you both very much for your testimony, and uh, yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, Ms. Torres. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Chairwoman uh, Waters and Ranking Member Stivers. I um, appreciate having you both here today uh, bringing forward this important piece of legislation. I know that you know, we're, we're trying um, to get to 100 percent that that may not be possible. Um, but overall, you know, I, I stand with this legislation. I know that we're going through a very difficult moment as a country and as Congress. Um, but we cannot take our eye off of the big um, strategic challenges that we are facing. And make no mistake, I agree with you 100%. You know, the big uh, uh, problem that we have and the biggest challenge is China. All you have to do is travel anywhere in the world, throughout Latin America, Africa, anywhere in the world, and um, where we can see the major influence that China has in countries. Um, I'm glad to see this bill has provisions to make sure that the bank is helping small um, businesses export, and we also need to be focused on minority-owned and women-owned businesses. I'm pleased to see that the creation of an office of minority and women uh, in inclusion. Uh, one of my amendments will build on this by requiring the agency emphasize outreach to tribal businesses, Great including idea. Alaska Native corporations that export goods and services that are made and assembled or otherwise derived from within uh, Native American lands. Uh, finally, it is critical that we remember that our values are among our most important assets in competing with China. Um, some countries around the world are seeing that and beginning to take a second look. Um, so this bill has important uh, prohibitions on doing business with individuals who are subject to U.S. sanctions. Um, and I've offered an amendment to further clarify uh, this prohibition also extends to individuals who are subject to sanctions related to the violation of free speech and human rights. Um, this is 
especially important given the growing challenges uh, to free speech across the world, including in Hong Kong. So I urge my colleagues to support the bill and to support both of my amendments, and I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just thinking that uh, in all the years I've been watching this institution, the, uh, the cold you were struggling with, Madam Chairman, is the closest thing to silencing you that I have seen in, uh, uh, in 20 years. I appreciate you fighting through it to, to be here, because I, I got to know. My constituents were asking me all, uh, all week about what we were going to be able to get done, given some of the challenges that we have in Congress. And I was talking about all the bipartisan things. And, went back, it was June that you all were getting ready to go to markup uh, on this bipartisan uh, legislation. And the, the headlines that, that I recall from, from back then weren't about outside groups opposing uh, the bill. It was, it was Democratic backlash was the, was the headline, and I don't know what the, what the details inside the caucus were. But thinking about good leadership and good followership, both of which the, 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 the Financial Service Committee has, um, we haven't done that many big bipartisan things this cycle. You are on the cusp of doing one, and I hear you when you say that outside groups were opposing it and you didn't want to have to roll over those outside groups. But candidly, uh, I would rather uh, uh, stick, with, stick with us uh, and roll over those outside uh, groups than, than shift gears uh, at their at their behest, could you tell me a little bit more about what bi those bipartisan majorities are so so fragile? Uh, what uh, what? Well, let me just, uh, if I may, respond. Um, we do have bipartisan. We just passed out TRIA, bipartisan big yes. bipartisan bill. Mm -hmm. We're working bipartisanly on reauthorization of the uh, National Flood Insurance Program. So we do have great bipartisan efforts, and we passed out the, a very strong bill uh, dealing with, uh, with the homeless uh, in our committee. So we have members who um, I have worked with for a long period of time, and we get along very well. I just think that this bill got complicated because of some of the negotiations that may be going on around tariffs and some other kinds of things that found its way into uh, this discussion. And the other thing is, you know, uh, jokingly, I said to Mr. McHenry uh, that uh, Mr. Henslin's hand was still in, <laughs> and still in, 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 in this negotiation and somehow. Uh, but let me just say this. It's not just that uh, I'm talking about outside entities that um, were concerned with what, what was first negotiated. I mentioned also that we had Democrats on my side of the aisle who have um, great efforts in their districts, where jobs have been created by some of these industries over the years, and they were not happy with the bill. So here you have uh, some of the biggest utilizers of uh, XM support. You have Democrats, and you have organized labor all together, all of those entities we're saying, you know, we can do better uh, than what we had negotiated. And I would, I would not ever uh, take up a bill where I didn't have the support of, uh, of uh, the caucus and that uh, it would be a bill that simply was supported by the opposite side of the aisle. That would not work. We would not be able to pass a bill. So I, I, would, I would beg this rules committee uh, to resist any of those amendments that would undermine our ability to do what the United States government should be doing and have a strong XM uh, uh, operation and be able to support our exporters and do job creation, because I think that's really where we all are. It's just now whether or not we're going to get over this one little hump. And I know that there are those who say, what happened to the bipartisan bill? The bipartisan bill did not work. And so now we have an opportunity to do what we need to do to strengthen the ability of our exporters to be able uh, to sell their goods and their services with the support of uh, XM and not allow other countries uh, to basically make us non-competitive and just wipe us off 
in terms of being able to uh, have this kind of an agency. So that's basically uh, well, the story. I can see the respect that you have for, for Mr. Stivers and the partnership that you all have oh, on yeah. so many oh, of yeah. these oh, yeah. uh, these issues. What I heard him say in his opening statement was that if we did, uh, it, in, in the Rules Committee's wisdom, make some amendments in order, uh, that we could win uh, his support. I take your cautions uh, about not uh, destroying the bill uh, to heart. I, I certainly do. Uh, but uh, I know in committee, every Republican amendment was defeated uh, on, a, on a party line vote. And, and ultimately, the only thing that turned out to be bipartisan was the opposition uh, to the bill, uh, where you still weren't able to win over all of those uh, Democrats with, with concerns. So we have a chance now to, to, to move that, that needle back, understanding you have to lead your committee, but your goal is to get this across the, the finish line. Uh, would you support our efforts here to try to move in that, uh, uh, in, towards the gentleman from Ohio's uh, 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 advice that says, if we make some things available and let the House work its will, we can get this across the floor and to the Senate in a big bipartisan fashion? Well, let me just say that as I um, pointed out, uh, the other work that we have bipartisan support on, you know, and I'm very, very pleased about uh, TRIA, I really am, uh, because I think that is so important in case of terrorist attacks, uh, that we have the kind of support that our insurance companies can rise to the occasion and help to rebuild, re, uh, re, 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 rehabilitate, et cetera. So I believe in bipartisanism. I believe that when we have these big bills, these complicated bills, that it requires a lot of work, a lot of hard work. I don't know what all of the amendments are, but of course, you know, we have come this far. Now it's in your hands. And so it's in the hands of the Rules Committee to determine what you're going to make in order. I cannot talk to each one of those amendments specifically uh, because I must admit I don't really know them in detail. But I have tried to give you a presentation to let you know how committed I am to jobs and job creation and to XM and to be able to support our export uh, uh, industries and to work with Mr. Stivers and others who feel the same way that I do yeah. about this. So do the best job that you can. The Rules Committee has been kind of lenient since you've left under the chairman's new leadership, uh, Steve. They're trying to make late amendments in order, trying to reach nice. out to both sides of the aisle and bring in as many new ideas as they as they can. So you wouldn't have gotten a chance to see all the amendments that, that have been offered. But to the chairwoman's point, can can you think of some? I, I've seen this committee turn some bills around that were headed to the floor under a for a completely partisan vote, and we've made some changes and, and brought big bipartisan victories out of the out of the chamber. Can you point us I, in the direction? I would like to speak to a few if I could. Please. Uh, and I'd like to start with uh, the fact that uh, I was a little bothered, or, you know, I, I wish we would have. Uh, I understand the China provisions were very uh, divisive in the agreed-to bipartisan bill. If that was the only thing that had changed in this bill, I would have been able to support this bill. But they went back to a, a whole nother, another version of the bill and walked away from every, in, every deal that was made, not just the China piece. The China piece I even saw some of the problems with. So I, if, if they would have just taken that out, I could have supported the bill, but that's not what happened. So I'd like to talk to a few things that I'd love to be made in order. Mr. Lucas has a couple of amendments that I hope will be made in order. I think he's going to testify on those in just a minute. Um, there, I believe there'll be an amendment on the small business mandate. I'd love to see that made in order. There'll probably be an amendment on the debarment penalties. I'd love to see that made in order. Um, I would uh, uh, love to see us uh, do something on, um, um, on China, but I also understand that that part is, is the harder part. Um, and if that doesn't happen, if we could even do something to keep the reforms for heavy users to show that they use the bank as a lender of last resort mm -hmm. and that uh, they don't uh, use the bank to help foreign entities at the expense of U.S. jobs. Mm -hmm. If those were made in order and, <clears throat> and were part of the bill, I, could I would probably support the final product. And, and again, you've signed a discharge petition against I'm, your I've own been chairman. A, I've been a supporter done. of XM at every turn, and I want to vote. I'm looking for an excuse to vote yes here, so I'd, I'd love it if, if this Rules Committee would help me with that. And when I, when I make note of those recommendations, then, those are not poison pill amendments. I don't believe any of those are poison pills, and you can ask the chairman if she thinks any of those are poison pills. They it, Did anything uh, take, come to take, China, take the China piece out of it. Uh, yeah. Take China out take of the it. China, not the China, all the other ones I mentioned. If any of those you think are a poison pill, I'd love to hear. Okay. Um, I'm just informed there are no... 
No amendments have been filed on small business. My bill does raise a small okay. business um, target from 25 to 30 percent. Okay. Okay, I guess that one. But the other, uh, the debarment and the uh, and the reforms on heavy users and the uh, and the Lucas amendments, if, if those were made in order, that would be great. I don't think any of those are poison um, pill amendments. We do often hear from folks yeah. bringing amendments that uh, that may well take the bill down, but yeah. I, I know that you're here to get the bill across. The I don't believe any of these are poison okay. pill amendments. All right. So they, take the spar sorry, I didn't well, realize okay, the, so the small business, business one was not filed. Is, is taken care of. Taken care of. Okay, that one's right. the, so that now, one. I am wasn't not filed. negotiating this bill. No, I understand. I'm know. not I, asking I, to negotiate. I, I, you're, there's you're, no more negotiations. <laughs> on this. Okay. Okay. And I'm not. Uh, I just want to tell you that we have not ignored the China issue. The bill includes a number of reforms to ensure XM financing is only supporting American exporters and workers and not bad actors. For example, the bill prohibits financing for certain entities, including the Chinese Army and intelligence services and other bad actors, including anyone who has criminally violated the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act or is listed for serious violations of U.S. intellectual property laws. So we have not ignored this at all. I mean, we, we, we went right to that. And so... Um, uh, in addition to that, in addition to small business, I think you mentioned something on the environment. And of course, the bill focuses the bank's attention on protecting the environment by creating an office of financing for renewable energy, energy efficiency, and energy storage exports, strengthening the agency's environmental policies and procedures, and encouraging great accountability with respect to local communities that could be negatively affected by bank-supported projects. Let me tell you about this environmental issue. Uh, on both sides of the aisle, we have people who feel strongly about environmental concerns in one way or the other. I have some people on my side of the aisle who want to get rid of all fossil fuels right now, today, tomorrow. That can't happen. But we recognize uh, that there are some concerns, and we address them what we think in a credible way, uh, that we don't ignore the issue. Uh, on, the other, on the other end of, um, of this issue, we have others who come from states where, you know, they have big oil and they have industry, uh, and they are not about to undermine the jobs that they produce at this time, recognizing that perhaps there is some way to state something over a number of years that can do something, but they're not going to go right to it and support those on my side of the aisle, that's mostly on his side of the aisle. Uh, and say, you know, we're going to get rid of fossil fuels right now. So it's complicated, uh, and I understand what people are protecting and what people care about. My job is to manage both of those uh, thoughts and come up with the best center that I can find, and I think that's what we've done in the bill. Hey, Mr. Tavers? W one more thing I'd like to add in a minute. I'd really like the Rules Committee to take a serious look at. Uh, French Hill is a filed a rule that will deal with intellectual property theft, mostly by China, and I hope you'll take a serious look at that one, too. That's a really important and serious amendment that deals with something that we all care about. The, uh, and so we, 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 we relate to that, and I don't know exactly what your amendment does, but we have included in the bill uh, some wording to deal with serious violations of U.S. intellectual property laws. We are let me just say as I wrap this up, uh, Mr. Chairman, let me just say this, that I recognize that China is a problem in the world, and I just feel very, very strongly that we have to do more uh, to involve ourselves in other countries. They're all over Africa, for example. That's because we have not been in these places, and they're all into the Caribbean uh, because they go in, they invest, uh, and they have governments that need a lot of support. And many of these small countries, and even some of the bigger ones, they're glad to have, and they'd have the United States if we would go. So one of the challenges that we have is to understand how we can use our influence and our resources to outdo them, because many of those countries would rather deal with us than deal with them. So we've got work to do. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope uh, folks will take... Uh, we don't get to see this kind of mutual respect at the table every uh, every day, and we certainly don't get to see folks working together trying to get it across the finish line uh, to the Senate. So I hope my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will take that uh, into under consideration. Thank I thank the gentleman for his indulgence. Thanks, Mr. Well, Mr. Perlmutter. Um, just a couple thoughts, and I, I thank you, too, for your testimony today. 
we spent a couple days on this two weeks ago or whenever it was. With respect to virtually all of the amendments, they were all about China, and there would be just a slight change in every one of them. So in fact, one of them changed the language from China to the People's Republic of China. And we were dealing with amendments like that for hours and hours and hours and hours. And most of those uh, failed. The, the reality is that over the course of the last few years, the Export-Import Bank has really shrunk uh, under the Trump administration, and, and in part because there was a, a lack of a quorum for the Export-Import Bank. So three or four years ago, five years ago, we were at $20 billion a year worldwide guarantees. We're down to about $3 billion. Uh, we went from $2 billion four or five years ago of guarantees related to companies uh, doing business in China down to $30 million last year. So, you know, individually, for any one of us, those are still big numbers. In terms of the world uh, commerce, tiny fraction. So there have been some changes, and, and it's been an ideological kind of fight that we've had. And so when the three of us chuckled about the ghost of Jeb Henserling, who's a friend of ours, but he was so <laughs> ideological on this particular issue that it's been very difficult. And for America to try to compete against China and other major economies around the world with one hand tied behind our back is silly. And so I appreciate, and, and the, the chairwoman really has tried to broker um, an agreement uh, between the Republicans on the committee and the Democrats on the committee, made some strides some places, but not others. So, so there's been a real effort towards bipartisanship. The ideology of whether we should be supporting an export-import bank, even though Mr. Cole may have supported it, Mr. Stivers supports it in some form or another, uh, it still colors this entire subject. So. I mean, there are a lot of amendments that have been proposed, a lot of China amendments, there's environmental amendments. You know, most of these things, I think, are ultimately poison pills to this bill. And I appreciate uh, Mr. Cole's comments. Well, you know, here's another place where there could have been bipartisanship. Well, let's move this thing forward, hopefully with the support of, of a number of Republicans. And the Senate will make whatever changes they choose to make. But this is... We can't continue to, to be operating with one hand tied behind our back. This needs to move forward. And, and I just thank you, too. I, you know, clearly, we have a lot of bipartisan uh, pieces of legislation. I'm proud to have worked with the two sitting there on the Safe Banking Act, yes. you know, which passed with a strong bipartisan, both out of committee and off the floor. So it isn't like it doesn't happen. It happens. But this one, there's an ideological component that's gotten mixed in with all of this that really has been to the detriment of our ability to compete worldwide. And with that, I yield back. Uh, I'll make the note that Dr. Burgess isn't here, but when he returns, I'll put him back in the rotation. But Ms. Lesko? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I'm going to ask two questions. But before that, good news from the Lesko family. I'm a grandmother again. Yay! <laughs> Healthy boy. Um, anyway, good news. <laughs> All right, my, my first question is for either one of you. What did the, the people that opposed the bipartisan bill, you said, I think you said it was the Chamber of Commerce, Boeing, and unions. What, what, what didn't they like about the bipartisan bill? Yeah. Basically, Water. generally, um, many of our industries have been involved with XM in ways that um, caused them to be able to give some support uh, to state-owned enterprises uh, that, um, that made good sense. We made money off of them. We supported, and then, you know, we've, we talked about everything from trying to list every, every business that may be state-owned state enterprise, every that is not state-owned enterprise. Uh, but what, what we came down to is that the fact that we should move forward, and we should go ahead and do business in the way that we know it must be done in order for our businesses uh, to uh, have 
good exports and substantive exports, and that we'll deal uh, with some of those uh, industries that may be state-owned enterprises. But in the final analysis, we're going to make money on them, we're going to get more competitive, and we're going to outdo the Chinese eventually. I mean, I think not only in what we do with XM, but I think that, you know, in our government and in our leadership, whether it's Democrat or Republican, we got to deal with China. Uh, and we're dealing with it in a way that we possibly can with this without undermining our own efforts for exports and jobs. And, and thank you, um, Madam Chairman. So it was mostly China, is yes. that the problem? Yes. And then how about the unions? What did, what did they not like about it? Uh, well, the unions get their jobs from these industries. Okay. These industries are important uh, because if these industries are not able uh, to export, uh, they're going to lose a lot of jobs. And so they locked arms. And they said, we walk down this path together. And so you have all of these industries and, uh, and organized labor and the Chamber of Commerce all came together around the bill to support it. Mm. Um, Mr. Stivers, did you have anything to add? Because I wasn't in the middle of the negotiations, it's yeah. harder for me. And I, I, I'll, um, I don't disagree with anything the chair said. I don't have any knowledge of it. So it, I, yeah. I trust that she's telling it the way it is, I'm sure. And, and um, my second question is just to clarify. So there is no delay in the small business um, part of it. In fact, you said you increased the yes, percentage to 30% right. or 25? Yes. Or, or is there a delay? We spent a considerable amount of time uh, talking about how we um, open up opportunities to small businesses. And I, I have some ideas about it. We have uh, a number of small businesses that are subcontractors to some of our huge industries. And I am looking at how we roll them off so that these small businesses, in addition to what they may be able to do uh, now getting business you know, and, and doing subcontracting, how they become supported by XM uh, outside of uh, and roll off of being the subcontractor and being direct contractor. So I think we have a lot of potential opportunity here. Mr. Stivers? Uh, the bill does delay the small business mandate to 2028. It does increase it to 30%, but it, it doesn't do that for nine years mm. in a 10-year reauthorization. All right, thank you. And Madam Chairman, do you know why you delayed it? Why in the bill they delayed that? No, I don't, uh, and I'm trying to remember the discussion on that, except to say there's a lot of work that has to be done uh, to get small businesses really involved. Uh, number one, we're going to have to create a, a database. We're going to have to do outreach. We're going to have to help uh, educate small businesses about XM and how they can be involved. We all, both sides of the aisle, support small businesses, but it's not something that happens overnight uh, because many of them, you know, just don't have a clue about XM and how it works. And so we've just got to do the work in order to bring them in. And I think we can, but it takes time. Mr. Stivers? The, the only other thing, and the chairwoman brought it up, and I'd just like to address it for the Rules Committee so they all un, everybody understands. So um, the one problem with the small business mandate under the Export-Import Bank is if you're a subcontractor for Boeing, let's say, for example, you're not counted in that number. I actually think we should count those subcontractors in the number. Um, but the current version does not do that. That would be another improvement. I know there's no amendment filed to do that, but I think it is something that we should count, and we don't get, they don't get credit for those things today. So actually, the Exim Bank is supporting more small businesses today than they're getting credit for because congressional math didn't make them add up, didn't give them credit for the subcontractors that a lot of these businesses are using. I support so, that. Yeah, and I think so we all we could support that. Bill. So I'd love to, maybe we'll work on that. <laughs> Before this thing kicks in, maybe we can work on that to give them credit for the things they're I doing. Because no that is that. something that right. that we should do, and maybe That's the right. Senate can fix that. But it's right. but it's something that I've known a long time, and and it's something we talked about in the bipartisan bill. We just never got to it. I, Denny Heck and I were working on a bill originally. It was something we were going to do: is give credit for the subcontractors, and and um, uh, you know, then I d haven't filed an amendment to do that, but I probably should have. But we'll work on that um, going forward because I do think. The whole committee and the whole house and the whole country should know that the export import banks actually supporting more small business than they're getting credit for as we sit here today. Well, if I may, that's absolutely true. And we have many of the subcontractors who come to Washington, D.C. 
uh, to tell us how important it is uh, for them to be able to subcontract with some of the bigger industries. Uh, they come every year, and they basically beg us to uh, continue to support XM so that they can do the subcontracting, and I think they should be counted also. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank I yield you back. Both of you. Ms. I yield back. All right. Uh, Mr. Raskin? Um, no questions, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Raskin's head is probably somewhere else right about now. <laughs> <laughs> I would think. <laughs> Ms. Ms. Scanlon. No questions. Uh, Mr. Morelli? I'm back Ms. Shalala? Um, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, in my district, Florida's 27th, there are 24 businesses that work with the Export-Import Bank. 20 of them are small businesses. We are big players, and the Export-Import Bank has been very helpful. Over $200 million in total, these 24 businesses. So um, there has been outreach, and um, uh, locations like mine, South Florida, Miami, have lots of small businesses, and of course, we're related to Latin America. We consider ourselves the capital of Latin America, so there's lots of there's lots of activity, and and it's uh, the export import bank is critical to us in terms of jobs and particularly uh, in terms of the small businesses. So I do want to say there are small businesses, yes. Yes. and more recently, a lot of what the export import bank has done is related to, uh, to small businesses. I also um, want to make a point about. Um, how important uh, the Export-Import Bank is to strengthening our national economic security because countries like China, and I've seen them operate with their credit um, agencies, their export credit agencies, they get their geopolitical influence by getting these, uh, by putting money out there, and it's absolutely critical that we compete uh, at that level. So I am a strong supporter of this bill. And I see it working in my own um, in my own district. Mr. DeSalle, yeah. All right. Um, does any other member of the committee wish to ask a, a, a question? Seeing none, I'd like to thank our witnesses for being here today. Please leave anything uh, you would like inserted into the record with our stenographer, and you're now free to go. And we're delighted. Um, uh, Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Lucas, that you are here, and I want to welcome you to the next panel. Uh, anything you brought in writing uh, uh, will, without objection, be entered in the record. And so uh, I now recognize my good friend from Oklahoma. I, I got two good friends from Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad Florida doesn't play them. <laughs> Just as importantly, what's in the best interest of the nation as a whole. And that's what brings me here today. I was not a part of the negotiations that were ongoing that crafted this bill, either the effort of bipartisan bill or the resulting bill when that was not successful. You see, one of my colleagues from Tennessee and I, the last time Export-Import was about to expire or had expired, used a 1910 rule procedure, a discharge petition, to bring the bill to the floor in order to pass it so that we could continue to have this economic vehicle with which to drive U.S. sales around the world. For some reason, that inflamed certain of my friends on both the right and the left. It wasn't viewed very well by my own leadership or the opposing leadership. I take those two circumstances as a badge of honor, and the fact that we were successful with the help of virtually every a member of the present majority who served at the time, and many of my friends uh, in what is now the minority, is a testament to the fact that sometimes you have to think outside the box. And that's what brings me here uh, this evening. It's become abundantly clear to me that the document which is passed out of the committee with every possible effort that Chairman Chair Waters could put into it to to craft a bill that would pass out of the committee, if it comes to the floor in its present form, I worry that while 
the bill could well pass across the floor of the United States House. What it will encounter in the other side of the building uh, won't get us a reauthorized Export-Import Bank. If anything, we'll wind up in a situation where as the CR, which expires on November 21, has to be addressed the same day that Export-Import to Bank reauthorization expires, we'll wind up with a short-term uh, continuation in the next uh, appropriation bill. And that's not in the best interest of the folks who are trying to use Export Import Bank or the folks in American industry who create the things uh, that are ultimately sold around the world. So that's why I'm here today. And it would be all right, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, finish a general comment or two about the process and then speak uh, to both amendments simultaneously, if that would be Please go agreeable. Ahead. Again, it's unfortunate that we've gotten to this point. I believe the ranking member of the Financial Services Committee and the chair of the Financial Services Committee have done their absolute best to reflect their conferences, to reflect their personal philosophical perspectives, to try and craft something, and that has not succeeded. So that's why I'm here today. I think we have to do something bold and dramatic to make sure this institution continues, and the Rules Committee is the place. I will be offer, will have filed and asked for your consideration two amendments. The first one is referenced, I believe, as Lucas number 17. It simply revise, uh, extends the authorization of the Export-Import Bank for 10 years under its current structure. Now you say, why would you go that route? Well, number one, there's an indication from the White House that such a 10-year authorization in its current structure would actually be signed into law if it made it uh, to the desk down there. That's a major uh, consideration. Also, I offer Lucas number 18, which would extend the authorization of the Export-Import Bank for, again, 10 years, raises the aggregate loan and guarantee and insurance authority to $175 billion, and provides for a temporary uh, board of directors during a quorum lapse. Again, if these two amendments are offered, I think you'd be quite uh, surprised by the coalition that would come together on the floor. Now, these two amendments might offend my friends on the right, might offend my friends on the left, but we're here to represent the folks back home who go to work every morning. We're here to represent people who create the things that are sold into the world markets. It's in their best interest, I believe, that as in the past cases, we look past our wings and focus on what can be done. That number 18 is virtually the same language as has been filed under a bipartisan bill in the United States Senate. So either one of these amendments, I'm confident, if allowed to be considered on the floor, if adopted on the floor, if uh, final passage occurs, would address for the next decade the reauthorization of this important institution. We can fight about the other issues as we fought for decades, but if we don't focus, if we don't focus, we're gonna wind up killing this institution, and that's killing jobs, and that's killing the pocketbooks of real people back home. That's the folks I care about. I may never be a star with my friends on either wing of the You're a star with me. <laughs> God bless you, Mr. Perlmutter. But the important part is taking care of those good folks. And with that, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, if there would happen to be any uh, questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. I now turn to Ms. Torres for any questions she may have. And Mr. Cole. Just, just quickly, Mr. Chairman, if these uh, amendments were made in order, I'd certainly be supporting the bill with my friends. So hope, uh, hope the committee gives them favorable consideration. Mr. Ranking Member, I think you'd be surprised the number of people because in the number of hours that this has been public, the number of co-sponsors to meet the deadline required by this body, uh, we have uh, 17 on one of the amendments, 14 of the others, and that's coming from our side of the room where there's a hesitation to vote for anything that involves export-import. A strong statement, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Parmata. You weren't involved with the conversations or the negotiations. This, I mean, I just, I guess I'm asking you from um, our experience, 
over the last few years on this particular subject of Export-Import Bank, neither of these amendments would fly. I mean, we've been operating on a very short time frame for these. We haven't had quorums. Why are you convinced that they would move forward and be signed by the White House? Because I believe the last time we went through this uh, torturous process using a discharge petition, we essentially extended the existing language and it got an overwhelming vote in the United States House, uh, passed quickly through the United States Senate. That First Amendment essentially reflects what the White House said yesterday and today they wanted. A clean 10-year uh, extension, no changes of any kind. So if you like the present Export-Import Bank, this ties it down through this administration and maybe whatever the next administration is. Certainty by a comb. And the Second Amendment addresses the most grievous weaknesses, the ability of the other body to shut an institution of the federal government down by lack of effort. And it also addresses the, the world has changed in recent years. That larger number is necessary to keep the bank viable. And you were a wonderful supporter of the last time we went through this process. Of course, sometimes it's easier to be an anarchist when you're in the majority. <laughs> As I, I was then. Clarification. I, uh, I thank the gentleman for his testimony. I yield back. Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, it's stunning to me that you can be the guy who files the discharge petition against your own leadership last cycle, and you don't even get a seat at the table uh, to be involved in the discussions this cycle. I, I, I hear the conversations about about uh, partnership and, and, and bipartisanship, but I, I just don't know how you, how you leave out a guy who's got that kind of passion. My friend, sometimes there are prices to be paid for principle, but I think the nature of this group, you know that's uh, just fine. But, but tell, tell me this. I heard Mr. Stivers say that, uh, that he did not consider these uh, poison pill amendments, that he considered these to be good faith efforts to move the process forward, trying to win the support of my colleagues here, which, candidly, I have uh, failed to do more often than I have succeeded in doing it. Uh, the question is, how does this move the, the chairwoman's uh, product uh, forward. If you get, if 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 supporters of your amendment get their vote on these amendments and lose, you still support the bank. What what comes next? Then it becomes a challenge because clearly in this language, I disappoint both the ranking member and the chair. But again, sometimes you have to make everybody mad if you're really going down the middle. They well, I I have. Uh, I have found it to be true uh, in our majority, Mr. Chairman, that sometimes folks just wanted to vote. And if you beat them fair and square, they could support your final product. But if they felt like they were getting jammed along the way, then they rejected a final product that they could have gotten around a yes on if, uh, if they tried. I hope we will make uh, the Lucas amendments uh, in order and give folks uh, who, who were with him uh, in the last dis discharge petition a chance uh, at, a, at a straight, uh, straight reauthorization. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Scanlon. Um, Ms. Lesko, um, Mr. Morelli, Ms. Shalala. You know, only in the House of Representatives would the status quo be described as bold. Um, uh, Mr. Lucas, would you explain to me what provides for a temporary board of directors in number 18 during the quorum lapse means? It essentially sets up the mechanism. I do not have the text in front of me, and okay. I'd be hesitant to, read, to quote it without reading the exact text to you on something of this nature. But we've gone through, in the last 10 years, periods of time when we have been without a functioning quorum. When someone in the other body chose to try and bring the institution to a stop, it was authorized at the time, but by strangling their ability to conduct a business, we try to overcome that. I call it my affection language for the other Thank body. Thank you very much. All right. Are uh, there, uh, yeah, Mr. Lucas? Uh, thank you for your testimony, and you're free. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other members who wish to testify on HR 4863? Um, seeing and hearing none. Uh, this closes the hearing, and I'm advised uh, by the chair uh, that, without objection, uh, the committee uh, stands in recess until 3 p.m. tomorrow. All right, got you out of here. <laughs>